Well, it's a privilege to be in the pulpit this morning. And if you've noticed in uh, the handout, we're going to be looking at Psalm 63. So if you want to turn in your Bibles there, uh, I'm going to pray for us once again, and then we'll get into the exposition of His Word. Lord, we... uh, do come to you today and ask that you would teach us, teach us to admire you more, to sit and be amazed at your plan for us, how sweet and how profitable your word is. We just pray, Lord, that your spirit would move in our midst. until the day that we see the fullness of our enjoyment with you. And we just ask these things, Lord God, so that you'll be glorified in Christ's name. Amen. Well, as I mentioned, we're in Psalm 63 today, and I've entitled uh, this message, uh, From Pain to Praise. Uh, Some of my old profs from the Master Seminary gave this psalm some other names because there's obviously various different ways that you can break this psalm down. Uh, One prof called it confidence through crisis. Another called it distress and desire in the desert. So if you like D's, you can use that. If you like uh, C's, you can use that. Whatever your preference is, they all have a similar theme. And I just need to make note, as I did just previously, there are a number of ways to break this psalm down, and I have chosen one way to do that. And so my hope is that as we work our way through this text, that you'll be able to see plainly how this text is broken down and how it applies specifically to each and every one of our lives. Let me just ask this. How many of us have had an experience in our lives that where we have found ourselves in a difficult spot, perhaps even alone, maybe even deserted by friends, or perhaps you're in a position or a job that you just don't like at all, or you're under heavy pressure from your boss. Maybe you've had the doctor come in and with several other doctors in tow and say to you, We're not exactly sure what's wrong with your loved one. They're in critical condition. We have no idea what it is, and we don't know if she's going to make it. Or perhaps you've known of persecution at work or just in a crowd of people that you hang around with. I bet if we went around the room, we could make up a list of possibilities, of real scenarios even, where we could find ourselves in a precarious place. For example, I recently read of one family who had a resume of suffering and trouble, and I've edited some of it just to share with you a synopsis of where they've been and what they've been through. The the mom wrote these words. Our seven-week-old contracted a virus and now lives with permanent brain damage. I ran over our five-year-old. Turn down the... uh, (laughs) I ran over our five-year-old in the driveway, but she did survive. Our eight-year-old's ruptured appendix sent her into septic shock, and she was in the ICU for weeks. My husband was recently diagnosed with a nasal tumor that was attached between his brain and his sinus cavity. Surgery and post-surgery care have become the norm for us. And as of this writing, the tumor is once again present and a second surgery is scheduled. Our son complained of a migraine only to become unresponsive and was diagnosed in the ER with a brain tumor that had ruptured and required immediate surgery. 
He then contracted meningitis and was quarantined. We might say, Lord, what's going on, right? Then a few weeks ago, my brother lost his five-year battle with cancer. She ends by saying this, it's a lot. It is a lot. And now perhaps if you're a young person here, you've not found anything like this in your life. Well, praise the Lord. But listen carefully today. Focus on what God's Word tells us. Because you are sure to understand and feel in, and find yourself in the midst of circumstances like this at some point in your life. I can say you're sure because of what God's Word tells us. Listen to Job 5.7. It says, For man is born for trouble as sparks fly upward. In other words, it is a sure thing. Man is born for trouble. Later in the book of Job in 14.1, he says, For man who is born of woman is short-lived and full of turmoil. Turmoil. The Hebrew word there has to do with trembling or being agitated or quaking, raging. So the question is, can the Word of God, does the Word of God help us? Can we glean how to handle circumstances like these, troubles like these in our own lives? Let me help with the answer by quoting Christian Counseling Authority J. Adams. In his words, he wrote this, Trouble is something all people must deal with. The loss of a spouse, a job, one's health, one's possessions, one's freedom. While God has not yet removed trouble from the Christian or the Christian from trouble, He has, by the Word and His Spirit, given believers all that is necessary to handle trouble successfully. Let me repeat that end. He has, by His Word and His Spirit, given believers all that is necessary to handle trouble successfully. Trouble is with us in this world. And King David was a man who knew trouble. Much of that trouble, unfortunately, was his own doing, right? And some of it was for his own good. A couple of things I need to note before we dive into this study. Initially, we could note as we read through this psalm, and I'm going to read it fully in just a moment, the psalm can be divided into two sections. Uh, It could be divided up into early in the morning or dawn in verses 1 through 5, and then in verses 6 through 11, it has to do with the night watches. So you can see in verse 11, it says that specifically. I'm sorry, in verse 6, it says that specifically. I meditate on you you in the night watches. In addition, we could say that the structure of this psalm is worth noting also because there are two identical sections really in this psalm and what Hebrew scholars call strophes. And you're going, what on earth is that? Well, I was going to throw up a thing here on the board, but instead of doing that, there's a handout in the back. If you're into this Hebrew thing, just grab a copy of that, and you can see how the psalm is easily broken down into two parts. And we are going to make it through the first part, Lord willing, today. I would also note that there's a superscription to this psalm. At the beginning of the psalm, it says, a psalm of David when he was in the wilderness of Judah. Sometimes these superscriptions, they have instructions. Uh, Like if you go back to Psalm 61 and 62 or 64 and 65, they say, for the choir director or the choir master. And they're giving, the the writer is giving some uh, instructions. Uh, Sometimes it has to do with a title in, in the superscription of a psalm. Other times, there's just information about the author. 
And that's indeed what we have here. So let me read through the psalm quickly so that we can get a feel for what we're going to be looking at today. A psalm of David when he was in the wilderness of Judah. O God, you are my God, I shall seek you earnestly. My soul thirsts for you, my flesh yearns for you in a dry and weary land where there is no water. Thus I have seen you in the sanctuary to see your power and your glory. Because your loving kindness is better than life, my lips will praise you, so I will bless you as long as I live. I will lift up my hands in your name. My soul is satisfied with marrow and fatness, and my mouth offers praises with joyful lips. When I remember you on my bed, I meditate on you in the night watches, for you have been my help. And in the shadow of your wings, I sing for joy. My soul clings to you. Your right hand upholds me. But those who seek my life to destroy it will go into the depths of the earth, and they will be delivered over to the power of the sword. They will be prey for foxes. But the king will rejoice in God. Everyone who swears by him will glory for the mouths of those who speak lies will be stopped. So this psalm associated with David stay in the wilderness as we see in that superscription in the beginning of the psalm. And if you notice in your notes, I, I included a couple of different possibilities in Psalm in 1 Samuel 23. He's running and hiding from King Saul, who was out to kill him. So it could be that passage of Scripture where this psalm was written. Or, more likely, and I would say absolutely, it's 2 Samuel 15, where we see Absalom's conspiracy, and David is on the run again, running for his life through the wilderness, through the desert, Based on a cursory reading of Psalm 63, we can say that the second is, is the reference to which the writer's telling us right now. How would I say that? Well, the end of verse 11, it says, but the king will rejoice in God. He was not a king in 1 Samuel, but he was a king in the 2 Samuel passage. So it is indeed when he's on the run from his own son running through the desert. David is running, if if you read through that passage, with not only by himself, but he's running with friends and he's running with women and children and he's running through the desert to get away from the man who's out to kill him, his own son. It's a sad place. One commentator said, David is in the desert of Judah, one of the most barren regions on earth. It is hot and dry, desert-type surroundings, rocks and sand, that's all there is. In essence, he's running for his life through that scene. And he's running from Absalom who has for years worked to steal the people's heart, to steal their loyalty from the king through lies and deceit. We could say Absalom would make a great politician, right? So that's the setting. And it helps us because this psalm will help us see some specific principles that we can apply to our own lives. Let's put it this way. In this psalm, we will see three attitudes to check on when going through trouble. Three attitudes to check on when going through trouble. Three attitudes, approaches, viewpoints as we go through difficult times. And I would ask, do I check myself when I go through hard times. This psalm has absolutely opened my eyes to what I should look to in God's Word when going through difficulty. 
Let me give you the three right up front, and then I'll, as we exposit the psalm, we'll do a double check on those. First, check your passion for God. Second, check your picture of God. Third, check your praise for God. The second part of the psalm I would call, entitle Procuring God. Procuring God. So let's get to work on the exposition of this great word from our Lord. First, check your passion for God. Personalize that. Check my passion for God. David begins with this exclamation. Look in verse 1. O oh God, you are my God. This is a cry that is in the emphatic position, right up front in this psalm. So he is accentuating, he is underlining this wonderful reality. O oh Elohim, he is speaking to. Basically, David is taking his yellow highlighter here, if he would have had one, and underlining that for us. Oh God, you are my God. He is saying this is the covenant-keeping God, the faithful one, the glorious one. And then he wants us to see that we all know that this is his God. You are my God, he says. Beloved, this is far more than those who thank God for the circumstances in life or when we so flippantly many times thank God for our food. He is clearly saying, this is God. This is El in the Hebrew text. The Almighty, the Maker, the Most High God. He is my God. That is my God. And he uses the first person singular on purpose. My God. This is my God. This is personal. This is an intimate thing for him. This is a relational experience for him. It's more than be believing that God exists. It is personal and distinctive. And so I would ask this question, if you want to make it personal for you, is that what you and I do first when trouble comes our way? Do you think first of your relationship with the Almighty or do you think of other things like means of escape? I know I've done that. Things that might help you out of the predicament that you find yourself in or the difficulty you find yourself in. We could ask, is your thoughts or my thoughts going to the supreme being, the promise keeper of the universe? Well, look at what, how David continues in this verse. He says, I shall seek you earnestly. He wants us to understand his desire, his passion, his hunger for this God. Remember, I, I talked a bit ago, ago about morning and evening. Well, we translate this little word here where it says, I shall seek you, that little phrase, seek you, is translated in the New King James and the King James Version, earnestly I will seek you. And the Hebrew word has a connotation of that. It can be translated to seek, to seek early. Um, and here, this form of that word is absolutely that way. It means to seek or to seek early. And so the King James and the New King James both have that translation. The ESV, the NIV, the NAS all include the term earnestly. And they do that on purpose, believing that that best represents the context of the passage. But either way you translate that little phraseology, it shows an earnestness. It shows an urgency, a rush by the writer, an importance to be with God. Perhaps it would be better said an eagerness to be with the Lord. Because that's personal for each and every one of us. We need to be earnest in our search for God. We need to seek Him earnestly. So check your passion this way. Seek Him 
Are you seeking him earnestly? Letter B, if you follow the text, and, and again in verse 1, it says this, My soul thirsts for you. Now think back, just a moment, we talked about the superscription of the psalm. He's in the wilderness. The Hebrew word has to do with large tracts around, large tracts of wilderness around cities, and here specifically, the desert. The scenery then is desolate. All around him, rocks, sand, scorpions. That's what we have. We could say we have some understanding of the desert because we've either driven through it, we've seen pictures of it, we have a perception of what that's like. And even many of us have a perception of thirsting when it's really hot in the desert and it gets hot in the hundreds of degrees. There is no shade and no tree in sight and you're on the run for your life. This is a tough spot. And so he says he thirsts. But what's interesting is, what really should speak to us is, he doesn't thirst for an escape or even water. He is thirsting for God. His description here is remarkable. I mean, we couldn't find a harder spot to be in running for your life in the desert. And it's interesting, David here could have used one of 30 Hebrew words to describe the trouble that he was in. David knew he must maintain, however, that intimate and vibrant walk with God to be strengthened and satisfied. And we should too when we're in tough spots. So we need to ask ourselves, Do I do that? Do I thirst for God? Like in Psalm 42, as the deer pants for the water brook, so my soul pants for you, O God. So not only seeking Him, but thirsting for Him. Letter C then would be found again in verse 1. where he says, my flesh yearns for you. My physical body is yearning for God. The Hebrew word means to long for, to faint with longing, even to crave. The word is found no other place in Scripture. He's letting the Hebrew themselves know that this is a, a new word that God has given me to show, me the, show you the hard place that I'm in. We have to be able to relate to him. And so he's showing us that. Lord, I am missing you in my life. The end of the verse, as I mentioned, says, in a dry and weary land, I yearn for you, I crave for you, I'm missing you. Father. Bad spot. David knew he must maintain that walk with God to be strengthened. So number one, check your passion. Ask yourself, when trouble comes, do I seek him? Do I thirst for him? Do I yearn for him? If not, perhaps you should confess to him. He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. When I'm in a difficult spot, would I write, I am seeking you. My soul is thirsting for you. My flesh is yearning for you, O God. In other words, my whole being is in a state of passionately wanting you, Lord. Do I seek him, thirst for him, yearn for him? That's the first thing we need to be about is checking our passion for God. Secondly, check your picture of God. And you're thinking to yourself, well, what exactly do you mean by that? Well, we need to read through verse 2. Thus I have seen you in the sanctuary to see your power and your glory. 
He tells us plainly that he had seen God. I have seen you, he says. The Hebrew word here can mean some various things. To see, it likely means to perceive God, to, to see by experience. You could say it that way. The ESV says, I have looked upon you. And David has seen him where? And he says in the sanctuary. So this is telling us about a past encounter he had back in Jerusalem. So, I'm going to ask the practical question here. Do I perceive God is with me in a trial? Think of the words of A.W. Tozer in his book, A Knowledge of the Holy, when he says, what comes to our mind when we think about God is the most important thing about us. Does the reality of an all-knowing, all-powerful God cross our minds when we're going through trouble? I believe that's what we see here. It's what's in David's mind. He's seeking, thirsting, yearning for God. He's seen God move in great ways, in marvelous ways, actually, in his life. You recall in 1 Samuel 17, his victory over Goliath, right? The whole Hebrew army is shaking, and the little kid goes out there with some rocks and a sling. God gave him victories over the Philistines in 2 Samuel 5. And then in chapters 17 and 25, he gave him victories over other nations, the Moabites and the Edomites. So David has seen God at work, provided and protected him many, many times. Other places, the hymn book gives us this as well. Psalm 27, 4 says, One thing I have asked from the Lord that I shall seek, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life, to behold the beauty of the Lord and to meditate in his temple. Behold, that's the same word that he uses here to see in Psalm 63. David uses statements like this in a number of other places. Well, back in Psalm 63, verse 2, at the end, he says this, to see your power and your glory. First, your power. The, the Hebrew word means strength, power, might, and fierceness. One commentator wrote, God is all-powerful. God's power is unlimited. He can do anything that is not inconsistent with his nature, character, and purpose. In Genesis 1.17, he says, I am the Almighty, the Shaddai, the All-Sufficient One. Or we could look at Genesis 18.14, where it says, Is anything too difficult for the Lord? One writer said, Impossible is not in God's vocabulary. God creates and sustains all things, and He never grows weary. Uh, Isaiah 40, 28 through 31. I'll let you look that up. The everlasting God, the Creator, does not become weary or tired. When you think of God's power, we must note that it is in reality beyond our comprehension. Psalm 62, 11 says, Power belongs to the Lord, to our God. Why? Because he is omnipotent, he is omniscient, he is omnipresent, he is transcendent. In fact, God's power is described in Scripture as great, strong, glorious, mighty, everlasting, sovereign, effectual, irresistible, incomparable, unsearchable, incomprehensive. Now, we could break out into a Theology One class right now and we wouldn't even know it. But that's not what David does. He brings up another excellent point where he says, to see your power, and then he says, to see your glory. The, the Hebrew word here means glory, honor, abundance. One writer put it this way, the infinite weightiness of who he is. That is so good. Do we, conf do we confidently understand the infinite weightiness of who our God is? 
We could say that glory means honor or ex- excellent reputation, like in Romans 3.23 where it says, all have sinned and fall short of what? The glory of God. We all fall short of His excellent reputation, right? In another sense, it has to do with brightness and beauty that surrounds God. Even the Son of God, where in Hebrews 1.3 that we looked at a while ago, says that he is the radiance of his glory. What is this radiance? Well, Revelation 21, 23 says, And the city has no need of the sun or of the moon to shine in it, for the glory of God has illumined it, and its lamp is the Lamb. Let your heart and mind dwell on that for a while. To see your power and your glory In some places, we might think of glory as described as great in Psalm 138.5, or glory as eternal in Psalm 104.31, or, or His glory as rich in Ephesians 3.16, or His glory as high and exalted in Psalm 8.1. The Scripture speaks of God's glory in Psalm 24.10 when He says, Who is this King of glory? The Lord of hosts, He is the King of glory. Exodus 24, 17 says, The sight of the glory of the Lord was like a devouring fire on the top of the mountain. Picture that in your mind. What the Hebrew people are seeing is God coming down to earth. You likely remember the stunning request of Moses, right? Show me your glory, Exodus 33. Perhaps David's thoughts are there. I think of Acts 7. 55, Stephen's getting stoned, and it says, He gazed into heaven and saw the glory of God and Jesus standing at his right hand. Crushed to death by the weight of rocks and seeing the glory of God. Listen, there are warnings in Scripture about not wanting to give God the glory that's due Him. You can check out Acts 12, 23 and think about Herod if you're doubting. The great Greek scholar J. Gresham Machen said this, the ultimate end of all things that come to pass, including the ultimate end of the great drama of redemption, is found in the glory of the eternal God. I think as 2 Corinthians 4.17, for momentary light affliction is producing for us an eternal weight of glory. Things to remember when we're going through hard times, right? So, you want to check your picture of God. He is powerful. He is all-powerful. He is glorious. He is supremely glorious. What do you see when you think of God? R.C. Sproul put it this way, I think the greatest weakness in our day is the virtual eclipse of the character of God even within our churches. God forbid that would ever happen here. We need to keep Him powerful and we need to keep Him glorious. Moreover, when trials or trouble come knocking, do I check my passion for God? Am I seeking Him? Am I thirsting for Him? Am I yearning for Him? And do I check my picture of God? Do I see Him as powerful and glorious? 
And third, check your praise for God. Listen to what David focuses on here. Look in verse 3. He says, because your loving kindness is better than life. Your love, your chesed love. The term can be translated loyal or steadfast love. And I like that. So we could read this, because your loyal, steadfast love is better than life. That's his focus here. Chased through the desert by his son who wants his life. Your loyal, steadfast love is better. That's David's heart. That's how our hearts should be thinking as well. But David's heart doesn't stop with that thought alone, and and neither should ours. He says in verse 4, So I will bless you as long as I live. I will lift up my hands in your name. I will bless you. The term means to salute you. I will praise you. I will give you the honor that you're due. He's saying here, even if this is the last of my days and I'm, I'm in this wandering for the rest of my life, my commitment is to acknowledge how great you are. I will bless the name of the Lord. This is like Psalm 16, 7. I will bless the Lord who has counseled me. Indeed, my mind instructs me in the night. Or Psalm 145, 4. One generation shall praise your works to another and shall declare your mighty acts. Parents, this is what we need to teach our kids. Grandparents, this is what we need to teach our grandkids. What a great and awesome God we have. I will lift up my hands in your name. David uses this terminology again and again. Psalm 28, Psalm 141. Paul uses it in 1 Timothy 2.8. Speaks many times of lifting hands in prayer and praise towards heaven. John Calvin put it this way. This was emblematic of acknowledging the power and imploring the assistance of God. When you see Jewish rabbis asking in prayer to God, they they don't do it like this. We see in so many churches, everybody's raising their hand. They do it like this, with their hands turned upward to God so that they can wait for the answer. Do we pray that way? Do we praise Him that way? What an awesome God we serve. Why? Because it's in His name. He is hallowed, sacred, revered, blessed. This is why David lifts his hands, waiting for the Lord to show him what to do. Praise and prayer going to the one that he is passionate about. One whose picture is that of power and glory. The one who can help in time of need. And that's verse 5. My soul is satisfied as with marrow and fatness, and my mouth offers praises with joyful lips. We understand after a Thanksgiving meal, what he's saying here, right? (laughs) My soul is satisfied with marrow and fatness. Here it's likely an expression of the hope of better days to come. In this case, he is understanding that after his thoughts are channeled in the right direction, not specifically how, 
it'll come about, but it certainly will come about because he believes in the power of this living God. He states he's filled or full. I have plenty and enough, so I offer praise with my lips. James Montgomery Boyce put it like this. First, he extols the living kind, loving kindness of God with his lips, verse 3. Secondly, with his tongue, verse 4, thus I will bless thee while I live. Thirdly, with his hands, I will lift up my hands in thy name. Fourthly, with his will, my soul shall be satisfied with marrow and fatness. Again, in other words, with all of my being, I am involved in my praise to the living God. Peter put it this way, Beloved, do not be surprised at the fiery ordeal among you which comes upon you for your testing as though some strange thing were happening to you. But to the degree that you share in the sufferings of Christ, keep on rejoicing so that also at the revelation of His glory you may rejoice with exaltation. So let me ask, do you and I in times of trouble check your passion for God? Are you seeking Him? Are you thirsting for Him? Are you yearning for Him? Check your picture of God. Do I dwell on His power and His glory? Check your praise for God. Do I praise Him, bless Him, lift my hands expectantly to Him? Am I satisfied and joyful because I know that He is with me? Paul wrote these words to the Corinthians, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies, the God of all comfort who comforts us in all our affliction so that we will be able to comfort those who are in any affliction with the comfort with which we ourselves are comforted by by God. If we were to continue on in this psalm, we would see our pursuit of God or procuring God, as I put it, Because in this psalm, he says, I remember you, I meditate on you, you are my help, you are my protection, I will sing for joy, I will cling to you, I will rejoice in you. Beloved, this is a a mindset that David had and that we can have too if we apply these truths to our lives. Trust in the Lord. Thomas Brooks put it this way, God hath in himself all power to defend you, all wisdom to direct you, all mercy to pardon you, all grace to enrich you, all righteousness to clothe you, all happiness to encourage you. Amen. He indeed is that God that we love and serve and praise. Let's remember these principles so that we can apply them to our own lives and share them with others who are in times of trouble. Let's pray. Father God, you are so good and so gracious to us. You indeed are a magnificent God who has indeed given us much. So we pray, Lord God, that we would be able to focus on you in times of trouble. Give us, through the power of your Spirit, that desire and that yearning, that craving, that passion that King David had. And we will give you all the praise and glory.